Please welcome uh, Florian Burkhardt. Thanks. Uh, yeah, before I start, I have to get one thing out of the way. Um, I never played World of Warcraft. This, I, yeah, I know it's a bit odd having this um, talk. The reason is very simple. I mean, I played Warcraft 1, 2, 3, and uh, it's one of the best games I ever played. And I know if I touch World of Warcraft, I'll probably be glued to my computer screen for the next three weeks or four weeks. So, years, yeah, okay. So I rather uh, look at it from a distance, like, like I do here. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, I got one of my first computers in 1982. It was a Commodore 64. And um, on my career, I first studied biology and then master of epidemiology, and uh, my, uh, my wife, uh, she's watching as well, uh, thanks to the video visit, she's now in Heidelberg, and, uh, ever, um, and since 2004 I've been uh, working at state and federal level public health institutes, however I'm here as a private person and I do not represent my institute here. Um, the World of Warcraft, you probably know it much better than I do. It's a massively multiplayer uh, online role-playing game, which means that uh, depending on the server you are at, it's like about 2,000 to 25,000 people at the same time interacting in a very complex way, um, usually killing monsters, but also a lot of other uh, interaction possible. And according to um, Blizzard Entertainment, in July 2007, they reached 9 million players. I don't know what the actual figures are now, but it's really massively multiplayer game. And the goal is like all uh, role-playing games, you start with a character, and that character you take through different levels. You slay monsters, first the easy monsters, then the more difficult monsters. Um, but um, it's also very intensive uh, social interaction um, needed in order to um, beat the more difficult monsters. And there's a lot of uh, interaction needed um, with, with other avatars, so with, with other human players across the globe. And there's also a lot of out-of-game activity. It's probably one of the um, computer games with most out-of-game activities, like um, fan conventions where they dress up as orcs and all other uh, <laughs> um, online denizens. And it's also a great world of adventure, and uh, I've only watched this, uh, I only watched people playing World of Warcraft, and I uh, got glued to the screen, because it's just very um, fascinating. And um, as I said before, you, the idea is to, one of the ideas is to raise your character from level one to higher levels. Uh, I think the highest level now is level 70, and next year you will be able to raise to level 80, and by uh, raising in your levels you become much more powerful, you get more life, you get more, more abilities and more magic spells, and you just become much more tougher. And it's also necessary in order to beat the so-called bosses, one of the uh, really difficult opponents, um, you shouldn't try this when you're level 1 or even when you're level 20 or 30. Um, this can only be achieved by several coordinated uh, avatars with, a, with the highest level. And um, in order to keep the online game uh, attractive, they, um, or they as Blizzard Entertainment, is subsequently adding more and more gaming content. And uh, one of these gaming contents was added in September 2005. Hold on, maybe I get it. Uh, does it work? Oops. Come, mortals! It's the wrath of the Soul Flayer! So that nice gentleman was um, Hakar, the Soul Flayer, and um, oh yeah, this is how he get he gets killed. I mean, this is about the size. You have these, well, this is the other one of the many avatars, and this big winged serpent uh, is Hakar, the Soul Flayer. So it's a really, really mean guy, and he had um, one very nasty um, attribute. He could cast a spell called Corrupted Blood, and Corrupted Blood. De dealt a lot of damage first, and then it dealt uh, additional damage over time. This is nothing new in World of Warcraft. Um, 
The new part was that the corrupted blood was infectious, it was contagious, it could spread from player to player. And probably the original intention of the game designers was to uh, force the players to spread out. Um, because if you stay together on a lump, then the infection will always, we come to this later, the infection will always jump back from player to player. So uh, this was a very good way to um, uh, disperse people. And this uh, infection was never meant to, oh, and it could not be dispelled. There are a lot of diseases in World of Warcraft, and you can do spells like cure disease or dispel evil disease and whatever. However, this um, spell, Corrupted Blood, could not be dispelled. So you had to wait for the full, um, for the full 10 seconds. Where is it? The full 10 seconds here for the effect to wear uh, off. Or, if, of course, if you died before, then you, you were dead and you didn't have to wait the 10 seconds. <laughs> and uh, by design, this spell was never, or this, yeah, this spell was never meant to leave um, this uh, dungeon instant called Zulguruk. Uh, however, since it's a magical world, people can teleport, so... Um, what happened was that infected avatars, or infected character play, uh, players, they, they ported back to the cities where they uh, lived, or where they, like, sold the stuff they picked up in the dungeon. And also one um, infection route was that hunters, which are a special character class, they have a pet which does all the nasty fighting. Um, and those pets uh, could be dismissed, like sent away, and they could be called back once you're in the city. Uh, however, if this happens, um, with a, if you dismiss an infected pet and you call back your pet when you're in the city, the pet is still infected, so it spends all the time in a freezer or something like that. And if this happened in the city, calling back your infected pet or teleporting back infectious, um, <laughs> the infection spread in the city. And um, this is taken from a guy, I don't know him, but he's called Fax Monkey. And um, um, yes, Hakar is the winged serpent. And just for one moment, please pay attention to the floor. You already see some dead people. They look like carpets. You see some dead people, but uh, the floor is basically clean. And this is the beginning of the, of the, um, of the plague. So you see people getting hit by this blood splatter. And um, as more people come in, and this is the place where you sell your stuff. Like you go to a dungeon, you slay a dragon, and you sell the booty of the dragon or the dragon's lair, and then you get some money. So actually a lot of people come here. There's a high contact rate in this particular place in Ogrimar, which is the capital of um, the, the, Horde, uh, the, the Horde faction, or the Orcish capital. And um, yes, I just fast forward here. And uh, now he's coming back, riding on his dinosaur. And you already see the dead skeletons here. If, the, um, if a player dies and um, he, he decomposes, so he first looks a bit like a zombie and then becomes a skeleton, and you will see all the skeletons lying around here. And there's even a funny orc, hold on, where is he? Yeah, this guy, <laughs> he says, the end is near. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I mean, this is just great. I mean, you 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 link into your to your com to your favorite computer game, and you you discover yourself being well surrounded by dead bodies. And now, and now he's the the, the fax monkey, the the guy there. He's coming back to the place where he was before, and now it's really littered with skeletons and dead bodies. And it was absolutely devastating. And uh, the reason for this was that the disease was never meant to. Um, to infect low or mid-level avatars because it is such a strong damage. Um, it was meant for high-level avatars who could take the damage and then just continue fighting. But uh, if this hits low-level avatars, they're just instantly dead. And this is what happened. Um, this event caught a lot of media attention. <laughs> and uh, re really, really a lot of media attention. Uh, th this is my favorite here. You see this, uh, I think it's a dwarf riding on a griffin. Is it Griffin? I don't know. Uh, Deadly Plague hits Warcraft World, and um, mo most, or 
half of those half of the headlines are taken from two years ago, and the other half is taken from this spring because somehow the topic was rediscovered. So this is a publication in a, in a scientific journal called Epidemiology, and it talks about modeling infectious diseases through online role-playing games. There was another publication how a computer game glitch could. No, which was the untapped potential of virtual games on real-world epidemics. So actually, you guys playing World of Warcraft, you can save the world by <laughs> playing computer games. Uh, no, I mean, uh, serious. I mean, yes, here it says uh, how, how you could help to fight off global, a global pandemic. And I will discuss this in the end. Um, the corrupted blood epidemic has a lot of... Um, a lot of characteristics which, which make it very uh, unique to, to, to model it. Uh, basically, since it's a programmed disease, everything is known. A lot of the parameters which we don't know about our real-world diseases are known because they were programmed. However, they were, as far as I know, there has no attempt been made at modeling it yet. And I have a very um, short excursion into modeling um, populations. It started very early, and uh, one of the early proponents was a guy called Malthus, and he um, basically stated that our human population is growing exponentially, however our food supply pardon me, is growing linearly. Therefore, we will end up with a catastrophe somehow, and it's the famous Malthusian catastrophe. And some people argue that right now we are experiencing this catastrophe because resources get shorter and we all grow, our population grows. And maybe some of you remember from biology class the Lotka Volterra, predator and prey cycles. It's quite simple. The predators go up, then no, the, the prey goes up, then the predator can feed on the prey, so the predators go up, but then there are too much predators, so the prey go down. So it's going up and down. And they, are trying, they were trying to model it um, with uh, mathematical tools. And the mother of all um, epidemic modeling was basically discovered by uh, Kermack and McKendrick. It's a classic SIR model, um, which the rest of the talk will be about, so I don't say anything about it now. And um, there is one very interesting branch in um, mathematical modeling. Um, it's, um, it was um, driven by uh, Russian scientists, or former Soviet Union uh, scientists, uh, because they had a planned economy. They had a great interest in knowing uh, how many workers will fall ill because of, for example, flu or so. And since it was a planned economy, they had a lot of numbers, which uh, they, they knew how many people traveled from one city to the other city. They knew how many people worked in one factory and in the other factory. And um, they did not have computers, so they had to use their brains. And they came up with a lot of um, very interesting formula. Uh, unfortunately, their publication was, of course, in Russian. So um, a, a lot of that knowledge was basically, um, well, it stayed in Russia. It was not published in the, in the, the, the American or, or British uh, literature. Um, but they, they had really, um, they discovered really a lot of things which were only uh, discovered much later. And after 9-11, um, there has been a massive interest in disease modeling. First, because uh, people were afraid that, say, a bioterrorism incident could uh, spread smallpox. Um, anthrax, by the way, is not very interesting because anthrax is not contagious, it's not infectious. I mean, anthrax kills you, but um, since you have the dusty powder in your, in your letters, um, it, it, it does not uh, jump from person to person. But smallpox does, and also plague would do. And then SARS, uh, the SARS pandemic was a very uh, serious reminder that, um, uh, th th that global health is really under threat by, by pandemics. And bird flu, I, um, one, one candidate for the next uh, influenza pandemic is H5N1. Uh, everybody has, has read about this in the um, news magazines or in the papers. Um, there's a, there's a lot of interest in being able to predict how a disease would spread um, through our human population. And uh, if you consider that with uh, air travel, you can basically jump from, I don't know, Bangkok to um, New York in how many hours? Six hours or so. Um, you can spread diseases really rapidly. And these uh, mathematical models, they have a quite substantial policy impact. And um, politicians ask scientists, <laughs> Um, how they should make their, or 
they ask them for advice. It's not that the scientists tell them what to do, <laughs> but um, they, they ask scientists uh, um, how they should formulate their policies and they rely on their mathematical models. And this has um, um, severe impact on like stop stockpiling or treatment priorities, like saying who, who gets treated first. So um, it could very well be that in the next pandemic, if you go to your doctor and say, uh, by the way, I would like to get some Tamiflu, he says, well, I'm sorry, you're not on the priority list. Um, and uh, so, so it's not just um, ivory tower science, it's, it's really used also in um, politics. The models come in different um, flavors. There are the compartmental models, which are the classic SIR models, which I will talk later about. And then there are other models, um, individual or agent-based systems. The nomenclature is sometimes very different between the United States, also uh, United States scientists and also Br British scientists. There are different groups and they are sometimes calling the agent-based systems stochastic systems. Um, what they actually are is they try to model the popu or they model the population based on the individual and you need uh, really a lot of computer powers uh, for doing this and um, you make a lot of assumptions and whenever in modeling you make a lot of assumptions you need to estimate your parameters from uh, from, from your, your real world data and um, those are they are very important and very interesting uh, models and they give a lot of insight. Um, however, you always have to be aware that if you describe, uh, I have to quote this, if you describe a, a complex poorly understood reality with a complex poorly understood model, then this is not uh, progress. So I will uh, focus on the SIR model. The S stands for susceptible, I stands for infectious, and R stands for recovered. Sometimes it's also called resistant because you are resistant to, him, to, the, um, to the infection. And um, all models make assumptions and these assumptions are always wrong. Um, you know these assumptions are wrong. But it depends on the strength of the violation, uh, whether or not it's important. And the, mo the most critical assumption of an SIR model is that you have homogeneous mixing in these compartments and that, for example, they, they have um, everyone who's in this compartment has the same um, contact probability to contact a person from here. And wh what it really is, is I have these prepared these cups it's, it's really quite simple. So you have your, uh, the drink of your choice. You put it in one. Um, you put it in one glass. And mm, let's say one infected person is in there because otherwise you don't have an epidemic starting. And all you do is you have one compartment and uh, it's flowing from one compartment to the next compartment and then it's flowing from this compartment to that compartment. And the really the difficult thing is to... Um, estimate the rates, like the arrows here. Oh, where's my mouse? These arrows. And I'm, I only have two slides with formula. This is one. And I just walk you um, through it. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this, in this transmission here. And um, I start by asking myself, what's the, the general contact rate of people meeting each other? And um, I just call this C. And I'm not interested in who is meeting who. I'm just saying just the general contact rate of uh, within a population is, I don't know, one person per second or one person every 20 seconds and so on. And if you go to the basement here in the hex center, you probably have something like, when you walk through the aisle, you get something like 30 persons a second. And the next step is that you ask yourself um, how many of those contacts are contacts with uh, infected people. And here you divide the total number, which is I, the total number of infectious, you divide it by the total number in your population. And N is simply S plus I plus R. It's a closed system. Um, and then you know how many of those contacts are made with infected people. And then it depends on your disease. There are uh, certain diseases which if you are susceptible, infect you almost 100%. Measles, for example. Um, if one person in the middle, or let, let's say we are all, nobody of us had measles, and one person in the middle had measles and would just go, hachu, then uh, very certainly the whole, everybody sitting around that person is infected because measles is so uh, contagious. Um, 
However, with tuberculosis, um, you need more contacts in order to get infected. So the transmission probability, where is this thing? The transmission probability is P, and this gives us now the number of, um, or the, the, the rate of one person getting, one susceptible getting infected. And if we multiply it with the S here, we get the total transmission rate of our population. So it's rather quite simple. And um, if you look at it, P and C and N, they are constants. How do I get this bloody thing? Um, and the term, the term S multiplied by I is nonlinear. And this makes the whole thing, the whole modeling uh, exercise very, very difficult. Um, and this is also why you can't use normal statistics because they usually assume a linear relationship. And this is why um, you basically enter a lot of um, differential equations and then let the computer solve these equations. And uh, what I used in order to solve these equations is a program called Berkeley Madonna. I don't know why they came up with this name. And it's originally used for modeling chemical reactions, but it turned out that it's just a really great program. Uh, you can download a demo version. Um, it's a great program for, for modeling infectious diseases. And all the code I need is here, this part basically. And um, you get really nice graphs and everything and, and nice sliders where you can play around with your parameters. Uh, you can download a demo version and the code window here, uh, you can copy paste your text. You cannot save your model but you just copy it to your Word, to Word or, or some ASCII text editor and you save it there. And um, this slide gives you some of the disease parameters. Uh, measles, I mentioned, um, already mentioned. And um, here you have an incubation period of, of about 10 days. You are infectious for eight days. Transmission probability is like 95%. However, you are immune. Once you, once you um, are infected, you, you, once you survive the infection or if you get vaccinated, you are immune. And it's... Uh, um, give me one second, please. Okay. Um, it's, it's airborne uh, transmission. Uh, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, so yeah, mode of transmission is sexually. Uh, condoms protect, by the way. Im immu no, I mean, I mean, I come from a public health institute, so I have to make a public health message. <laughs> um, immunity is weak, which is why people get reinfected again and again. And, uh, however, the transmission probability is not that high, so please don't nail me on, on these numbers. I mean, nobody can tell you whether it's really 30% or 40%. Um, it takes about one to three weeks. Another really interesting infectious disease is norovirus. Um, one of the effects is called, in medical literature, it's called projectile vomiting. <laughs> I don't know if, I mean, it's one of the diseases you, you, you read which uh, happen on a cruise ship. So if everybody on a cruise ship is like throwing up or getting diarrhea, it's most certainly norovirus. It has a very short incubation period. Transmission is very high. And immunity uh, is only um, possible against certain subtypes. So once you get infected with one type, you, you are immune against that subtype and so on. Then we have corrupted blood and by Design, <laughs> by design, it's uh, infectious for 10 seconds, unless you die earlier. And um, transmission probability, and this is a bit insane, is 100%, so you always get infected. And immunity, no, you can't get immune from it. There is a caveat, but um, I come to this later. And transmission is, yes, magic. Um, it's more droplet-like, because it's like everybody around you, so it's, it's definitely not sexually. So, um, yes. And this is, w what you then do is you just draw your boxes and your arrows before you write down any maths. Um, and um, here is something peculiar to World of Warcraft, since you don't die, oh, there is no permanent death. You do die if you, I don't know, the dragon eats your head or cuts your head off or something like that. But then you, uh, you, you end up on the graveyard, and 
this on, on the graveyard, you are, you are technically you are immune to corrupted blood. So for the sake of modeling corrupted blood, uh, the graveyard it should be the G depart, um, compartment, but here's the R compartment for keeping with the uh, nomenclature. Um, you, you cannot be infected by uh, corrupted blood while you're on the graveyard. However, um, uh, once you resurrect, either because your friends resurrect you with a magic spell or you just choose uh, resurrection on the, on the graveyard, uh, you lose your immunity. So you have a constant replenishment of susceptibles in your world, in the world of Warcraft. And this model um, is called a Zirs model. Um, and it exists in the real world. It, it exists when you are immune to something, but um, when you lose your immunity. I mean, usually we lose immunity to all diseases, but we die before this takes effect because, um, yeah, because we die. Um, <laughs> so, what? Yes. Um, a, f a friend of mine said that the video I was showing uh, is actually a volat the, the spell of volatile infection and not corrupted blood, but for the sake of, uh, of the points I'm illustrating, it's the same. So now I'm showing you what happened with low-level avatars. Um, this is not it. The video is looping. Hmm. Should be. <laughs> So the guy running around in the middle is spreading the disease. <laughs> and, and, and they only die this, uh, after the second blast, so um, they, they, they are quite strong. But they are low-level characters. I mean, I could watch this for minutes, <laughs> uh, for hours, actually. I mean... And this is what a lot of people did. They just waited to get infected, and then they just ran around infect infecting everybody else. And uh, you have to keep in mind that in order to to play in the server, you you pay money. So if you pay money for being dead all the time, it's it's not a good business model. So I stop here. So. Um, now this is done with uh, the Berkeley Madonna um, program and uh, you enter different parameters. I have three different um, scenarios, A, B, C. And I start with 3,000 players, which would be like the number of players that are on a, on a uh, World of Warcraft server. Uh, it's only one infected person. And I just assume that I have a contact rate of two contacts per second which would be, I think, fine. Uh, it's, it's a good estimation for, for the city of Ogrimar. And uh, what you see in the graph here, time is on the x-axis, and uh, number of people is on the y-axis. And we have the black one, it's the susceptibles. The red one, the red never touches zero. The red one are the infected, and the uh, reco well, recovered <laughs> on the graveyard, the recovered are green. And you see the system is fluctuating a bit, but in the end, when you look at it, uh, about 85% of uh, subscription fee play paying players are spending their time on the graveyard. <laughs> and um, in scenario B, uh, it's everything is the same. Uh, the only difference is the contact rate. I have one contact every two seconds. And um, you can't see this, but the, the scale is different. What happens is that it's oscillating. Uh, it, it takes more time to reach an equilibrium. But in the end, you end up with 50% of all um, subscription fee paying players in the graveyard. Now, scenario C is quite different. Um, I start with 500 infected people, and I have one contact every five seconds. And here, the infection dies out after about uh, six minutes. So. Um, the contact rate does have an influence on um, on the endpoint of your disease, and um, I will come to this uh, later. Now there is a next uh, different model. Uh, we have a high-level avatar, high-level avatars. So uh, they they are those who can survive like a thousand damage or two thousand damage, and they can they they have toys and stuff that 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 makes them reload their, their, their health. And what happens is that they get infected, 
and they recover. However, they recover without uh, gaining immunity. And this is a model typically used for sexually transmitted infections, uh, like syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia. You don't have a lasting immunity in for, for these diseases, so it's bouncing back and forth. And uh, you can see, um, since, since these are all modeling assumptions, it's always uh, important to check with reality, or in that case with virtual reality. And um, I found a really nice example. This video is looping as well. Mm. Here, I turn it down a bit. Here you see um, it's, it's Ironforge. Yes, yeah, Iron, Ironforge, the big city, uh, or the, the halls of Ironforge, the home of the dwarves. And um, unlike before, they, I mean, they get hit by the disease, but they don't die. They, they're quite tough. Some of them die, but most of them don't die. And um, you see the disease bouncing back and forth. And uh, when you look closely, then this character um, survives the 10 seconds, so he's not in infectious anymore. But then someone passes him. I think it's that guy. Yeah, yeah. Now he gets. Yeah, now he gets infected. Yeah, he gets infected again. So this is what would happen in a classic SIS model. And uh, I was very glad to find it uh, proven by this nice video. Um, so. Yeah, this, this was the situation you just saw, S, I, S, bouncing back and forth and back and forth. And um, this is now the same results, a bit um, dry or graphically. I use the same uh, parameters, of course, here they are now recovered because you don't have the compartment recovered anymore. Um, we start with 3,000 players, one is infected, two contacts per second, 95 stay infected all the time. So it's the red up here. So 95% of your players in your World of Warcraft world are infected all the time. Now, if the contact rate is a bit lower, uh, you have uh, like one contact every two seconds, well, 80% of people stay infected all the time. And uh, it's still not very good. And um, if you have one contact every 20 seconds um, and start with 500 infected, then it goes down to zero. So something, there must be something with the contact rate going on. And here's another concept in uh, epidemiology and um, modeling infectious diseases, the concept of R0. Um, I'm using the British mm, version, how, how I learned it sometimes. You, you could call it R0 or RO. Uh, I just learned it the way it's called R0. And uh, R0 is just a concept. And um, it says, uh, how many people does one infected infectious person infect if everybody is susceptible? So at the very beginning of an epidemic, um, like everyone in this room here is, um, is susceptible, and we just drop one person uh, who is infected, how many of us could that person infect? And that number is R0. And you... Oh, people try to, to build a concept around this, and one concept is that you um, take, well, you use these, um, you, you write it in, in you, you, you rewrite it in terms of duration of infectiousness, the contact rate, and the transmission probability, and um, it intuitively makes sense because if you uh, stay infected for a longer time, you have more opportunity to infect others. At the same time, if you contact a lot of people, you infect more. However, if you uh, go down in your basement and don't meet anybody, like a classical qu quarantine or isolation uh, measure, you, you, although you, you, uh, it might be a very contagious disease, you don't infect anybody. Um, and then the transmission probability, if there is a disease which doesn't really infect people or you need to meet 100 people in order to get infected, then you will infect fewer, um, you will create fewer secondary infections. And uh, in the SIS case, for example, uh, we have the duration, which is 10 seconds. The transmission probability is insane. It's one. It's just, well, stu well not stupid, but it's... Um, it never, it never happens in nature. Um, and you, the contact rate is, is left over. In the SIRS case, uh, I just assume that you die after two seconds. So like after two blows, you're, you're dead. So you remain infectious for uh, four seconds. Um, you can do the same calculation with six seconds or two seconds. 
And um, the interesting thing is once you conceptualize the um, in f the, the, the epidemic or the, epi the, the dynamics in the epidemic in this way, you can ask yourself, <coughs> um, or you start with what is R0, how many people uh, um, does one infectious person infect? Um, what are the, the boundary conditions for R0 to become lower than one? Because if uh, infected people infect fewer than one person, then in the end the epidemic dies out. And it's quite simple, you just solve this uh, equation or this unequation. In the case of SIRS, you have four times C times one, must be smaller than one. You do some really difficult maths and you come up with uh, the contact rate has to be uh, lower than a fourth. And I, this, is this, this is the scenario C. Uh, where I had one contact every five seconds. <laughs> That's why I chose this value, actually. And uh, um, the infection dies out. So, um, yes. So, so, so that's, that's how the R0 is also connected with the, with the SIR model. And um, this concept also helps you to think in terms of interventions, like what can we do in order to control disease? And I mentioned uh, already quarantine, you can just reduce the contact rate. Um, <coughs> if the contact rate is zero, then R0 is zero. So um, you have to pay special attention at um, quarantining the, the uh, inf infected people. The problem with influenza is that you are infectious without uh, getting ill. So you feel all right, but you already spread the virus. Um, with smallpox, it was different. The second you had the, the, the smallpox postules, you were infectious, but you weren't infectious before that. So you could actually see when somebody was infectious and then you could quickly add and vaccinate people and vaccinate everybody around them. With uh, influenza, um, it's, it's more difficult. Then you have treatment, you could use Tamiflu, for example, that reduces the duration of infectiousness or that reduces the transmission probability. Some people uh, propose, yes, you should wear face masks, face masks because then the transmission probability is also greatly reduced. Um, social distancing is a term which basically says stay at home uh, or, or just don't meet anybody. Um, and in the context of World of Warcraft, it also means stay on Ogrima's rooftop, which uh, the next video is showing. And there can be some interventions which, are, uh, which have a very good intention, however, they are counterproductive for the whole um, epidemic. Um, the corrupted blood epidemic could not be controlled by Blizzard. They had to reload the world. They had to really shut down the virtual world, change the parameters make corrupted blood not infectious anymore and then just reload the world. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> obviously we can't do this with the real world. So, um, the next video is quite funny. It's again by, um, it's again by Fax Monkey, and it's, it's looping as well. So here you see people on the rooftop, they are socially distancing themselves. Um, some people down there actually shout, yes, we should spread the disease up there to the people on the rooftop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I mean, it's really funny. You should, you, um, you, uh, it's called, what's it called? If you Google Fax Monkey and Corrupted Blood, you, you, you get, the, I think it's a, it's a 30 megabyte download. It's really funny reading all these messages here. And they are just watching and seeing the epidemic raging through Ogrimar. Now, the laser beams in the background are a magical healing spell called Chain Healing. And uh, the intention is to help others to 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 stop them from dying and to to uh, I don't know to reload their, their their life points. However, by doing this, they um, they are increasing the the duration of infectiousness, um, and this in the end makes the disease dynamic worse. So what they should do is somehow have um, social isolation and then do the healing. Um, I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't help in an, in an epidemic. Um, <laughs> um, of, of course you should help, but you, you, you have to be really careful what you do, uh, because in the worst case you uh, actually make things worse. And for example, in the SARS, SARS epidemic, they <coughs> because it was a, respir <coughs> a respiratory <laughs> infection, <laughs> Um, they wanted to uh, ease breathing, 
And uh, in the hospital, which had a really high infection rate in the end, they started to put, um, how, how are they called, the, um, the dumpfer, the, the steam, the, the menthol steam to make breathing easier for the patients. And um, that they had a little machine which, which blew um, s steam, hot, hot water steam, to, to make it easier for them to breathe. How is it, how's it called? Humidifier, yeah, something, yes, like a humidifier. However, if you have an airborne infection, um, <laughs> no, I mean aerosolization is really the last thing you want to do. Um, so the very good intention of helping people uh, turned um, this um, epidemic, in the case of SARS, uh, even um, worse, or m made it, made it uh, worse o only in this particular uh, hospital. Now, here's the R0 of some diseases. Um, you can look it up in the literature. Measles has a very high R0. Foot and mouth disease. Um, in the UK, fe February 2001, which was also covered by press, they started with 8.4, and then when they found out that it was actually the sheep spreading the disease and the movement of sheep around the country spreading the disease, um, they stopped animal movement and it was reduced. And um, influenza, for example, has an R0 of about three. Uh, yes, public health message, condoms protect against HIV. Um, and corrupted blood, if you take the SIS version, you have a, t a duration of 10 seconds, and if you have five contacts per second um, in the city, you have an R0 of 50. And this is just insane. Now, um <coughs> oh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> it's the R. <laughs> I'm recovered. I, I, I'm, I'm not drinking from the eye. <laughs> Um, now the question, is World of Warcraft an epidemic simulator? Yes, of course, it's the largest human-based agent system. So uh, you do not program uh, human. You, you, you wait or you have um, human decision, yes, this, this was a nice phrase, human decision and behavioral choices versus computer simulations. Um, people enjoyed uh, infecting others and enjoyed <laughs> dying. <laughs> I mean, this is what you just saw. They, they run around, infect others, and watch them die. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and World of Warcraft especially is very complex, and um, there is a lot of fine-tuning uh, possible. There's an immense social interaction, and it's geographically distributed, so you could even model different uh, cultural preferences, like what people would do, I don't know, in Asia or in the um, United States or in Europe or uh, I don't know where. Um, and, uh, however, there's a really big flaw in this argument. Um, the human risk behavior um, is not modeled by World of Warcraft. I mean, if you have no permanent death, um, you, you just don't go out and try, what happens if I get infected? What happens if I get the plague? Um, so, the, hum the, the, the human risk behavior is not modeled by this game, and this is why a lot of people say, yes, it's interesting to look at it from the disease dynamics point of view, but do not use it as an epidemic simulator. And um, the players might not reflect the general population. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, the, the greatest problem which I, as a public health person, have is there's no disease surveillance implemented. And this is a, a, it's a really big uh, tragedy, tragedy that um, Blizzard um, didn't have, um, didn't count who got ill and who didn't get ill. And uh, another moral point would be, is it ethically right to allow your avatar to take part in a medical trial? Uh, oops. And uh, there are some ideas for making better virtual epidemics. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, you, wh wh why should an orc infect an elf? Uh, I mean, wh why should a virus be able to infect orcs and elves and all, all, all online, uh, all, all avatars with the same probability? So you could have a transmission matrix, like human infects human, very good. Orc, orc, very good. Undead, they are so full of disease, they infect everybody. <laughs> um, however, an orc, is, an orc is really tough, so he doesn't get infected by a human. Um, the human is more a wimp, so he gets infected by everybody. 
And um, th this would just make it more <coughs> a little bit more complex, but also maybe a little bit more realistic. And um, I think it would be really interesting to reintroduce infectiousness in World of Warcraft. Uh, you could add immunity, or also waning immunity, and um, this would have some quite interesting scenarios where you, for example, have all um, horde players which are immune against the disease uh, except for one infected orc. They are raiding an uh, alliance city and they are basically infecting everybody and since it doesn't hit them because they, um, they, 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 they are immune to this disease, they would probably win this raid. Um, you could add vaccination. We have it in the real world, why not put it in the virtual world? You could have an incubation period, and this is something really nice. You could have um, race. <laughs> I mean, I, I like the tower, and really, I mean, they're, they're one of the they're one of my favorites. And uh, you could have foot and mouth disease. I mean, cattle have foot and mouth disease. Why not taurin? You have mad cow disease. <laughs> uh, orcs could get orchitis. Um, it, it really exists. It's an inflammation of your testicles. <laughs> uh, and, and we are humans, so we are used to measles. So why, why, don't, why don't bring measles to human population in World of Warcraft? Now, uh, this really exists, uh, otitis externa. I asked my wife, she's a medical microbiologist, it's moldy ears. <laughs> so they could have like rotting ears or something like that. And uh, most important, you should uh, collect and share data, and this, this goes to Blizzard. So if you do this again, really log who gets ill and when they get ill and everything. And uh, here, a um, short list of links and references. If you really want to learn about uh, modeling diseases, you must go to this course. It's not cheap, but it's really, really good. And uh, the program, Berkeley Madonna, is available here. And uh, a friend helped me very much with, since I don't play in World of Warcraft, uh, he helped me very much explaining everything. And of course, all images are taken for educational uh, purpose. So uh, just game on. <laughs> Any comments or questions, please raise your hand. I'm coming through you. Um, I was wondering, what if you, you have, like in World of Warcraft, you've got a mixture of high and low level uh, characters, and I saw you saw the SIS model and the SIRS model. Yeah. Uh, what if you combine the two? I mean, you go, we'll have a mixture of high and low level characters, like you saw high level characters infe infecting low level characters. Mm. Um, what? Oh, sorry, I think I broke it. Did I? I think when it fell, I broke it or something. Can, can, you, can you fix this? <laughs> ah, okay. Um, what you would do is you just draw more boxes and you, um, you model the, the flow between these compartments, because this is what the compartmental models do. And uh, this is done for, for, for diseases. Or, or you, you could do this and, and you just add more um, hold on, you just add more differential equations up here. But in the end, one model would, um, would ba basically out outrace the other. So it's probably, if you have a lot of low-level character, it will be uh, SIR, a Zers model. However, if you have a lot of high-level character, then it will represent more or less an SIS model. Yeah, up there. I can repeat the question if you shouted. Have you talked to Blizzard? Have I talked to Blizzard? Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> Why not? I was so busy, I'm sorry, but uh, I had really a lot of things to do and um, I, I didn't, didn't find the time, no. Sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, thanks to the video, video wizards, it's, uh, it's, it's on the net. So, um, I mean, my email is there and it's somewhere there. Oops. Somewhere there. Yeah, that's my name, by the way. Yeah, more, more questions? 
Yeah, you, you should, if you shout it. Um, what, what if your uh, C is nonlinear? Uh, so in the SIRS model, uh, if uh, you, you have people going to the graveyard, yeah. but is there, is, I, I don't play World of Warcraft either, so is resurrection immediate? Uh, how do you take into account that if uh, a higher number of people go into the graveyard, your contact rate will go down? So it's, so it's nonlinear. So how do you model well, that? Uh, well, the contact rate probably would not go down, I think. But what would go down is the, or what would go up is the uh, number um, of people. Y you mean if this time here, if this is uh, sped up, or if people get resurrected quicker, is, is that your question? Or no, no. What, what if uh, be, because people are in, in the graveyard are not active players? Uh, d does the contact rate include contact with uh, non-players, no, like players uh, who are in the graveyard? Uh, th th that's the beauty of modeling. The contact rate will stay the same, but the number of susceptibles will go down. So right, well, what I'm saying is if you remove people from the system, there will be less uh, people to actually come into contact with, so the, the that, contact that's rate true. will be non-linear. The total transmission rate would go down here. If people stay on the graveyard, you have less susceptibles. So the contact rate will stay the same, and the model will catch this by using the, 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 this S. If, if uh, but, but that assumes that C includes skeletons and not just people running around, correct? Uh, yes, but this is why you, why you have the, the compartment, the number of uh, susceptible people and, and, and the contact rate uh, as a... Um, I think what you... What you, ref um, what you want to, what what you want to say, what what you want to include in the model is is is, in if more people are in the graveyard, then you have fewer uh, susceptibles. So this is this is included okay. in the model. Okay. Okay. But but we we can talk after uh, okay. five minutes. I don't know how much time we have. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>